Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this afternoon's Crew News Conference. Joining us are NASA astronaut Mike Fossum, cosmonaut Sergei Volkov, and JAXA astronaut Satoshi Furukawa, members of the Expedition 28 and 29 crews. The three are scheduled to launch on a Soyuz May 30th with docking to the space station on June 1st. Their mission is expected to conclude with a landing in November. We'll now start with introductions and then take questions. We'll begin with NASA astronaut Mike Fossum, who will serve as a flight engineer for Expedition 28 and as commander for Expedition 29. Mike was born in Sioux Falls, South Dakota and grew up in McAllen, Texas. He holds degrees from Texas A&M University, the Air Force Institute of Technology, and the University of Houston Clear Lake. Mike received his commission in the U.S. Air Force from Texas A&M University in May of 1980. And in 1981, he was detailed to the NASA Johnson Space Center, where he supported space shuttle flight operations, beginning with STS-3. He was selected for Air Force Test Pilot School at Edwards Air Force Base, California, where he graduated in 1985. Mike resigned as a colonel from active duty in 1992 to work for NASA. In January 1993, Mike was employed by NASA as a systems engineer, serving numerous roles before being selected as an astronaut in June 1998. He has flown on two space shuttle missions, STS-121 in 2006 and STS-124 in 2008, and has performed three spacewalks on each mission. With that, we'll now turn it over to Mike to introduce his crew. Hi, I'm Mike Fossum, commander of Expedition 29. Uh, we're excited to be here. We're excited to be part of opening up the second half decade of human, or half century, rather, of human spaceflight. It's a really busy time for us. Uh, uh, Scott Kelly returned uh, to Houston on Thursday morning after his landing in Kazakhstan on Wednesday. And uh, this morning, uh, Ron Guerin and his crew, including backup uh, uh, Dan Burbank, left Star City, headed for Kazakhstan to go through their final flight preparations. So it's a really busy time. Uh, we're just a couple of months behind them and uh, going through our final uh, work here in Houston this week. And uh, Sergey is heading back to Russia. We'll be joining him there very soon. I'd like to introduce my uh, three crewmate or my my crewmates. First, uh, to my left, Sergei Alexandrovich Volkov. He was uh, born in Ukraine and grew up in Star City, Russia. He's married and has two sons, the youngest of which is only two and a half months old. Uh, he's an Air Force pilot and uh, was selected as a cosmonaut in 1997. He's uh, trained on several backup crews and for a period of time trained with the uh, STS-121 crew uh, to fly with me on 121 before there were some crew changes and uh, we missed that opportunity to fly together. But we made up for it in 2008 when he was the commander of uh, Soyuz TMA-12 and the commander of Expedition 17. And he hosted us on Discovery on uh, Mission 1J STS-124 when we installed the Japanese laboratory. So we've been in space together. Uh, during that, his previous flight, he had two EVAs. Uh, he is a hero of the Russian Federation and the uh, first, second generation space flyer. I'm really, uh, really happy to be flying with Sergei again. Uh, to my far left, Satoshi Furukawa. He was born in Yokohama, Japan, and uh, grew up there. He's married and has a son and a daughter. He is a medical doctor, a surgeon, and has a PhD in medical sciences. Uh, it's been observed he's probably the most educated crew member to fly on the U.S. Uh, on the International Space Station. In, uh, in spite of the uh, double uh, degrees there, we refuse to call him Dr. Doctor. Uh, he was selected as an astronaut in 99. He's had extensive training, first in Japan, then in Russia, then in the United States in three primary languages. He served previously on two backup crews. He'll be our main flight engineer on the Soyuz and a flight engineer on the space station. And I really look forward to uh, sharing his first flight. All right, thank you, Mike. We'll begin with questions. And if you'll just state your name and affiliation. We'll start on this side. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm Mark Corot. I'm representing Aviation Week and Space Technology. And I think I'll start with uh, Mike Fossum. Could you uh, sort of give us a little bit of the flavor of the sort of scientific activity and the pace of research that you anticipate during your stay on the station. Hi, Mark. Good to see you again. Uh, the, uh, where we are now is moving out of the assembly phase and into the more extensive science phase. Because of the addition of STS-135, there's a lot more logistics coming up, and so we're going to be dealing with a little more trying to put things away and make room to work 
uh, while we're up there too. Uh, the sciences, it covers the gamut. The first would be, uh, you know, us as the guinea pigs, studying everything from the, the, the standard bone, muscle, uh, uh, cardiovascular system, and things like that. Um, we do have a, a few new things going. Uh, and and uh, one that's really interesting is, uh, is using a Doppler uh, 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 measurement system to actually look, or I'll be operating that and studying Satoshi's heart and the valves and the changes in the heart itself. Uh, first at rest, and then he'll go work up a sweat, and we'll, and we'll, uh, we'll wire him up and, and get more. Uh, I'm doing a different exercise protocol called the sprint, which uses a higher intensity, shorter duration kind of exercise, and they want to compare that to the results with uh, doing the more nominal kinds of exercise. Uh, we, uh, in addition, we've got some different nutrition studies, high protein, low protein, differences in uh, sodium salt levels, things like that, all trying to understand those, uh, those basic effects on the human body. Uh, we're also watching the eyes uh, closely these days. Uh, we've seen some things. Uh, and changes in vision, and so we've come. There's more ways of measuring the eyes and keeping track of that. So, uh, we really are the lab rats, the guinea pigs for a lot of the stuff. Uh, there's a, a wide variety of other experiments, all the way from you know plant growth type experiments uh, from you know zero to two Gs, um, uh, material science where we're, we have the, uh, the the samples of materials in the furnace with different cooling uh, uh, sequences and things like that for the uh, crystal growth. Uh, one that's one of my favorites is a, is a flame, uh, it, it's a flammability or a flame experiment where we're studying the effects of microgravity on the flames at, with different uh, fuel mixtures and a very, you know, uh, and trying to actually get the flame to lift off using, lift off of the, the burner so it's a suspended flame in and moving air uh, and, and getting into the real physics and, and chemistry of the, the details of the, of the flame propagation like that. And uh, as a second question, I wondered if, if whoever it's most appropriate could talk about any spacewalks that are planned at this point. Well, sure. Sergey and I can both talk about them. We right now are each scheduled for a spacewalk. Uh, mine is with Ron Guerin, my 124 spacewalk partner. We've been outside three times together and look forward to uh, stepping out when uh, uh, Shuttle Atlantis is up there for the 135 mission. The purpose of that is to get the uh, the pump module, which failed about nine months ago or so, and we want to bring that failed pump module to the ground so it can be analyzed and see why it failed so early. Uh, it failed prematurely, and part of what we hope to learn out of this program is why things fail and uh, learn how to make them better. And so it's a really high priority to get that pump module uh, back to the ground. So we'll be moving that from its stowage location uh, outside the, uh, close to the uh, U.S. airlock and uh, is putting it into the uh, payload bay. Uh, we'll be picking up another uh, experiment uh, payload in there called the RRM. It's a Goddard payload. It's a refueling type uh, uh, activities and uh, moving that to a temporary still location on the, uh, on the space station. Um, and then the uh, SPDM will relocate it later. Uh, that should take us somewhere around three hours. And after that, they've got a, a, a host of tasks that we'll get into. It depends on how priorities rack up, but more than likely swapping out a, a bulky uh, camera on the exterior of the space station and uh, maybe getting into some other, uh, some other tasks that may, uh, you know, whatever's left after the uh, next two shuttle flights. Hi, Robert Perlman with collectspace.com uh, with a question, I think, for Sergey. Uh, granted that TMA-01M just landed, but during its flight it, it experienced uh, a couple of issues, one with the Neptune display system and a pre I think a pressurization issue during launch. Um, in the preparation for your own spacecraft, the second in this digital series, um, do they have an understanding yet what, what the issues were and how that's going to be corrected on, on your spacecraft? Uh, I'm going to start from uh, pressurization issues that they've had during the pre-launch. Uh, actually, they uh, figure out this very quickly and like maybe two weeks after the launch of the uh, 700 Soyuz, uh, they knew what was the reason. The reason was the wealth, the new material that they used, and they just switched to another material. And we don't expect to have these problems in, in our. And actually, it's not only our Soyuz, it's all uh, previous Soyuz that going to be launched. I'm, I'm talking about Expedition 20, 28. Um, so, 
Самокутяев, Борисенко и Рон Герин. Что касается Нептуна, они могли сделать реперменты, вы, наверное, слышали об этом. And the, the advantage of a new uh, software that they uh, were able to reprogram the uh, Neptune and they received practically whole data uh, after undocking and landing. But we have uh, backup equipment already in, installed on, on board on our vehicle, this uh, uh, device that already was checked by the expedition uh, that recently returned from space and they work properly. It's, we have already installed this equipment. And uh, since all three of you represent three different countries, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what outreach activities you're doing to reach out while you're in space to your respective populations and to the population of the world. Satoshi-san, why don't you start off? Oh, okay. Uh, from Japanese point of view, uh, I'm going, going to uh, perform uh, many outreaches, I mean, PAO events or educational events, uh, especially in Japanese. That would help uh, people uh, in the Japanese-speaking uh, society to uh, get, uh, get to understand the space program, program better. Uh, from my previous experience, usually we have sort of together um, PO events when we are going to be three of us, we'll talk with the kids. Or primary, that's our primary target, to talk with the kids, with the students, uh, to inspire them to be not maybe the astronauts or cosmos, but at least be involved in this program, you know, uh, where we can explore something new for us. Uh, and of course, each of us will do um, PO events with um, our own citizens. And for me, it's going to be, of course, Russian, uh, Russian schools, Russian maybe institutes, and uh, some highest authorities because it's fifth anniversary of the first space flight and uh, the year dedicated to this. And of course, it's a lot of attention right now, and I expect that we'll have more. Uh, till the end of the year. And for me, I'd say in general, having flown two short duration missions on the shuttle, you're so busy. It's a, it's a complete race for the two weeks that you're up and the, the short time that you're on the space station, eight or nine days. I look forward to having the opportunity on time to not just, you know, working in space for a short time, but actually living there and having the opportunity to do more of these kind of, of, uh, of activities, just to reach out and, and help share the experience. Jill Tolk, representing Bay Area Houston Magazine. Question for Sergey. Uh, of course, you've flown on station before. What will you think be your most challenging part of your mission this time and the most rewarding part for this mission? Uh, honestly, it's hard to tell before the flight uh, that going to be the most challenging part of our flight uh, because you may only expect something, but... Um, so far, just to live for a long period of time out of our families. I think that's the most challenging part. But still, and I'm sure 100%, none of us will want to be back home earlier than it's scheduled. And it's also sort of challenging part. And rewarding part, be able to work on board the space station to that's, I think, the most rewarding part of the space flight. Mm -hmm. All right, switching to this side. If you can state your name and affiliation, please. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask to Mr. Furukawa uh, about the Japanese big earthquake. So, in Japanese, all right? Thank you. え、古川さんすみません。え、日本の被災者の方々にえ、地震の被災者の方々にエールをちょっといただきたいと思いまして、え、今回のやっぱ古川さんがうちに行かれること、日本の人々はとっても夢とそこに希望を託していると思います。え
、えー、心よりお見舞い申し上げます、えー、我々含め世界中の人が応援しています頑張れ日本そして、えー、私個人としてはできる私にできることを忠実に任務をこなすことで、えー、被災された方そして日本の皆様世界の皆様に貢献できたら嬉しいと思ってます。Uh, okay. uh, our thoughts and prayers are with those that suffered a great deal of damage from the big earthquake in Japan. And Ganbara、uh, Nippon,、uh, we are with you. People all over the world are with you. And、uh, I'd like to do whatever I can to、uh, contribute to science in order, in order for others, for, for those that have suffered from the damage and for all the Japanese and for all the people all over the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay.、Uh, Jim Oberg with NBC. Hello. <clears throat> Can I talk about the digital Soyuz again? This is the, only the second flight.、Uh, are there additional test flight, additional test objectives for you to broaden the envelope, the, to widen the capability of, this, of the new ship? Are you doing special activities in the beginning of the mission and at the end of the mission to、uh, further explore the digital Soyuz capabilities? Actually, for us, it's going to be the middle of our autonomous flight to the station、uh, when we'll,、uh, we'll use for almost 100% all abilities of new uh, CVM uh, for, for the docking. That's、uh, the, going to be really new because previous Soyuz, they just use、uh, only partially all these、uh, abilities. That's our primary goal is、uh, testing.、Uh, 700 saves. Very good. And、uh, another more, more practical question.、Uh, once you get there, both Russian Kyutas will be occupied. Where are you going to sleep?、Uh, <laughs> I hope Michael will allow me to sleep in Note 2 as a commander. We'll make room for it. Somewhere. All right. There's six Kyutas. Yeah. Just draw straws. Good luck. Thank you. Hi,、um, I'm Atsuko Miwa from TV Asahi, Japanese television network. I have a question for Mr. Furukawa. I also like to ask the, the, what is the most challenging and also rewarding part of this mission for you? Okay.、Uh, challenging part,、uh, I cannot imagine.、Uh, well, because this is my first flight, everything, I am very excited at everything. Uh, during the mission, and I can't tell. <laughs> and that,、uh, well, everything is the re rewarding part. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Actually,、uh, excuse me,、uh, I've been training,、uh, taking training for 12 years.、Uh, in other words,、uh, I dedicated one fourth of my life to astronaut training. So, I'm really looking forward to that, the mission. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Marianne Dyson with the National Space Society. I had the pleasure of working with, with Mike、uh, 30 years ago、uh, in the Flight Activity Officer's Support Room. And I'm wondering if you could describe how you've seen flight planning evolve from that time period to the way you work with Mission Control nowadays to plan your typical week up on the space station. Wow, yeah, Marianne, it's good seeing you again. It's been a, a lot of changes since, since we were flying with one space shuttle orbiter and then figuring out how we were going to handle two. And we were going to write flight procedures to handle the minor differences in those two vehicles. And、uh, at, at, in those days, all of the flight procedures were completely rewritten for every flight because they were six to eight months apart. And we had time to rewrite them to a cruise whims. If you will, and there were a lot of them as people had their own preferences. As we've moved forward beyond that, we couldn't rewrite the procedures to everybody's personal preference, and you had to begin training to more standards and standardizing things and coming up with standard ways that procedures could handle differences.、Uh, you know, and, and so the, with a space station, it's, it's quite different, and we don't carry 90 to 100. 
pounds of books of procedures anymore. We really just have very few, primarily emergency books and a few others that are in paper. The rest are electronic. Uh, when we first began that, it was um, frankly very frustrating. And uh, a lot of us were skeptical that we would be able to move from paper to electronic procedures, but they, got a, they finally got really smart with it where you can link from procedure to procedure and you can hit the back button. It takes you back to that nested procedure where you left off and pick it up again. It's actually quite good now. Uh, you can write your values in on the computer and it saves it for the ground. On space station, also the, the, the crew or the ground is very busy replanning your, your, not today, but tomorrow and the day after, really planning about a week out with a lot of details. So we try to get our job done today, but if we don't get it all done today, then some of it goes into tomorrow or the day after. And so a lot of it's kind of modular, modular where different things, we're working on maintenance activities, and then you complete that and you step into the, the science procedures, you go change out the samples, activate a rack, uh, make some observations, that kind of thing. And so it's all done in blocks using an electronic planner, the onboard short-term plan viewer, o OSTPV. It's the bane of our existence. There's a red line marching across and all of the procedure blocks that you're supposed to be doing and you look and you see that I'm behind again. Uh, and as you're really scrambling and, and I've, I've seen that even on a short shuttle flight, like, oh, you know, it's, it's <laughs> But it's, it's a wonderful thing because it, it, it's a graphical way, a very visual way of knowing where you are, what's coming up next, what your crewmates are doing. And, uh, and you can see if somebody's getting behind that, you know, where you need to roll over to give them a hand and help catch up. And you can also see dependencies where different procedures have to be done back to back in order and you can't get things out of order. So it's amazing from the days when we had to rewrite 100 pounds worth of procedures, you know, custom write them for, for a shuttle flight to where we are today. Okay, any other follow-ups on this side of the room? All right, if not, we will switch back to this side where we believe we have at least one follow-up. Jill Tolk with Bay Area Houston Magazine. We've asked Sergey and Satoshi one question, so let's ask Mike, what's the most challenging part that you think might this, this mission might bring to you and also the most rewarding part? Uh, the most challenging is gonna be separation from family. You know, I, I have uh, four kids and a brand new granddaughter that's just uh, three weeks old. And so I'm going to, you know, miss seeing them. Uh, but, you know, the, uh, I, I look forward to the challenge of doing this. I've dreamed about doing this since I was a small child. I was working in mission control when President Reagan announced the start of the space station program in 1984. I came back to NASA and began work in 93, just when we kicked into a, a fairly extensive redesign. And uh, a few months later, the Russians were major partners in the program, much to our surprise. And it's been a great partnership and a, 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 just a great benefit to us all. And so it, that all of this working for all these years and now to, I helped build it, helped design it in ways in, during the redesign process in the mid 90s. I helped build it on uh, STS-121 and 124, and now I get to live on it, not just visit. Uh, Gina Sinceri, ABC News for Mike. Forgive me if this has been asked, but are your Aggie boots going up? <laughs> <laughs> There's no room for my Aggie boots on board. <laughs> so in lieu of the boots, what will you be taking from A&M? No, there might be an Aggie ring or two on board, yeah. Thank you. You bet. There, there'll be a few other things, too. <laughs> All right. Any uh, remaining follow-ups? With that, uh, we'll conclude our briefing. A reminder, you can find information about the crew and the International Space Station on our website at www.nasa.gov station. Thank you. <laughs>